here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week is going to be the turn of the author, writer, Rich Deakin, who has just brought out a book called Grievo, the loud and lousy sound of gay bikers on acid and also crazy head. This has just come out on Head Press Publishing and it is a classic of our time. And um, I'm not just saying that. It's one of my books of the year. It's a brilliant read. Um, It goes through the entire history of the bands. Um, Lots of fantastic photographs, stories. It's a masterpiece and also an amazing insight into that musical genre in the 80s and beyond with various times when they reformed. Anyway, this is the interview. So after several minutes of casual chat, we got down to that exciting subject that was really sort of talking about the the term Grebo and uh, what it all means. Anyway, um, you're going to find out more because Rich is going to tell us. Rich, it's over to you. There are all these sort of various little subgenres and subsections of the 80s indie scene. Um, the Grebo scene, I think, uh, as the book kind of explains um, quite well, was, was a music press constructed genre. Well, particularly one journalist in particular, which was James Brown, I think, who took the name Grebo from a Pop Will Eat Itself song, uh, No Grebo, I Think I Love You, um, which. It, in those days, I remember it when I was a kid as well, that it was sort of kind of not so much a derogatory, but it was perhaps a derogatory term for sort of like sort of heavy metal kids really at school, the ones who used to wear the denim jackets and the patches and the long hair. But he took it and um, applied it to a genre, which I think he's explained since that for basically no other reason than to try and create a genre um, and lump a few bands which he was into under it. I mean, and so they had something to write about, something they were interested in. Um, it was sort of quite kind of heavy. It was drawing on aspects of psychedelia, punk, um, heavy metal. And then they were also things that were coming in at the time, like hip hop had just started coming in a few years previously and dance was coming in. And there was with a couple of bands like uh, Pop Elite itself and Gay Bikers on Acid to an extent combining these sort of elements. But uh, the Grebo genre really was, I think, like many things in the music press, it was a press construction. Yes, it's quite interesting because because initially I sort of had that 80, you know, like that, there's the punk period, and then there's post-punk, and then there was a bit of a grey area, and then there's kind of the indie world, you know, not just the, about the record label, but there was a sort of sound, and in a way it was kind of, for me, from 83 to 87 was the years of the Smiths that seemed to have this big impact. And then there was all these kind of bands that came around. And then there was the cassette with the enemy and which I know is another, you know, like way to put it all together. But there was definitely that, that kind of feeling of like bands like the Triffids and the go-betweens and the Wolfhounds and all that kind of scene. Mm. But then kind of 87 came along and the, and that, as you probably realise, most bands have a five-year narrative, don't they? They get together, they have a great time for 12 months. The first single, John Peel plays it, just John Peel session, things are going well. First album, brilliant. Second album, a bit tricky. And then anybody who ever tours America seems to come back and break up. And also by that five-year narrative, the next wave of 16 to 18-year-olds coming along, 16-year-olds, kind of want their own band. They're almost like, yeah, I don't want that. That's been around for three, four years now. I want to discover it. So there's always kind of room at that point for new music to come along. And I guess, you know, people like the gay bikers coming along just seemed quite different to the the sort of whimsical world that was the Smiths, wasn't it, really? I think so, yeah. I mean, from my perspective, for sure, um, I I was... I got into punk when I was about 12 in 1977. So when I left school, um, I, I sort of still carried on with that, that punk so I'm, that punk look. I mean, I obviously flirted with other genres, yeah, with other subcultures as well, like two-tone, but they, they all kind of overcrossed. But I know I was sort of what would be called C82 punk scene these days. We didn't actually call it then then. We were just still early 80s punks with sort of leather studded leather jackets and spiky hair and Mohicans and things. But I know I also kind of flirted with things like the psychedelic, the psychobilly thing between sort of early 80s, 82 and 86, say, when the gay bikers started. And I, I never really got into the Smiths myself. I, I don't know whether it was because I was, um, 
I was kind of blinking with that sort of punk attitude for quite a while, to be honest. And I, I don't think it was really till the early 80s, 83-ish, that there was a, a chap in a record shop in Cheltenham. Everywhere has always got one of those hip record shops, you know, yes. the record shop to go to. And this was called Drifting. It was in Cheltenham at the time. I'd moved from Leicester a few years before when my parents moved down. And um, he used to sort of probably get pissed off with us, uh, just always oh, play the new UK Sebs record, play the new Crass record. And he took it upon himself to kind of, um, you know, sort of try and educate us, for want of a better word, into sort of music that had been before or, or other stuff. You know, he, he wasn't particularly so much into the Smiths necessarily either. He was more into jazz and things like that. But I kind of started getting back into things like Hawkwind. I mean, it may have been something to do with the recreational sort of pastimes I'd also just started discovering as well. So I kind of realised there was a bit of a bigger thing outside of punk and um, just sort of the sort of twee side of indie, which I, you know, again, it's a bit of a generalisation because it wasn't all like that. And I actually do like a lot of the indie music that I probably didn't like at the time now, you know. Um, so I, you know, I still kept this sort of punk thing about me. I'm still sort of a kind of a punk at heart. And, um, but I'd also started getting back into older sort of stuff like Hawkwind and Edgar Broughton Band and the Pink Fairies, which I've already also written a book about, which obviously I was inspired by many years ago. And, um, and that's it. When sort of like the gay bikers came on, they kind of, uh, the playing sort they were influenced by all these these type of bands that I'd started now rediscovering discovering which had been around before and were combining things with like contemporary sort of punk and sort of 1980s India and also even sort of rockabilly psychabilly stuff so it, it really appealed to me so in that respect that's how I really got into it and they were also from Leicester which is where I was from and I had an old mate who I'd kept in touch with from Leicester who was still sort of quite well hung around in the same circles in Leicester and got on well with them. So, you know, to me, it was a no-brainer. I was really into it. Yes, absolutely. I think it's always a bit strange, though, when you've been in a scene and then you feel a little bit like the old dude at the gig. You feel a bit self-conscious at times. And I've, I don't know, I've once or twice had that moment. So I can see why sometimes it feels a bit strange. And I know a few friends who were a bit older who heard the Smiths and went, oh, my God, I hate them. You know, what? You know, they're so self-indulgent. And I was at that age where it's like, yeah, I love that self-indulgentness. You know? So it was kind of what you can relate to at the time, isn't it, really? But what was great about your book on many levels and something that I've always been slightly interested in as well is that kind of the political, social, cultural kind of period of the 80s where, you know, Thatcher gets into power in sort of 79 and then we had the Falkland War and then we had the Greenham Common then we had the, um, yes, the, the miners. But then you touch on, on the kind of the whole travellers, the great peace convoys, we used to call it back in the day, as if they were yeah. peaceful at all. So there was that kind of element of kind of, it's like Mad Max and also a sense of youthful desperation that actually everything was a disaster and we were all going to be unemployed. So a lot of the bands I've interviewed for this show spent their early years often on job seekers allowance or enterprise allowance schemes, managing to find a thousand pound to put on their bank account, which I always wonder where they got it from. But anyway, best not to ask, isn't it? And so they, they had that kind of youthful experience of wanting to go to the festival and get completely slaughtered, didn't they? Yeah. Um... And again, I think it comes back to what I was saying a few minutes ago, this um, thing about rediscovering a kind of past, which previously it would be at, at loggerheads with your sort of idea of what punk's about, because you're sort of like harking back to the 60s and this hippie idealism, but they're both colliding. It was when this kind of anarcho-punk sort of thing collided with the sort of hippie subculture as well, and they, it became this traveller thing. And that's where... Um, Several of the bikers were into that. Uh, I don't think Crazy Head were necessarily so much into it, but I think, I mean, a lot of teenagers, whether you're into the Smiths or whatever, everyone was going down to Glastonbury or Stonehenge in the early 80s before Stonehenge was banned. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of ironic that you're saying everyone's into this, you know, the bikers are all being anarcho punks and all that, but then at the same time, Thatcher's doing these things to keep the doll figures down by. Uh, doing like job enterprise schemes or you know you know what I mean and sort of providing people with 27 quid a week to sort of try and create bands or do t-shirt printing businesses or whatever 
He so, should be. They have a great business. Yeah. <laughs> so well, many. Yeah, well, that, that helped people sort of get that, you know, a bit have a go, you know, and I think there was a certain amount of cynicism. But then a few of the people I've interviewed are, are still doing the business they started in 1982. So it was kind of like, well, well, actually, it did. What, so from, from those job enterprise allowance schemes or whatever they were called, you'd be a, not job, what was it? I can't remember the exact name of them now. But you know yeah, what I it mean? Was enterprise allowance and. Enterprise allowance scheme, yeah. Enterprise and job scheme. But there was a, and I can't remember who they were from. They were from either Newcastle or the Northeast. And, you know, he said, yeah, I've still got my printing company that I started on that scheme, which is still ticking over. So it's like, God, that's amazing. The name might come to me. So when, so when the band started, obviously, what you mentioned, Brist, um, not Bristol, Leicester, and I remember being, you know, like religiously listening to the John Peel show. And the great thing we had about the 80s, without getting too nostalgic about it, was that we had the gatekeepers, didn't we? We had three weekly music papers and Record Mirror. Then we had John Peel. And then every city and town had an alternative venue night. So, you know, you had the Princess Charlotte, and then there was like Brighton, Bristol, Norwich, you know, the Duchess in Leeds, Glasgow, you know, every every band that could sort of get a John Peel session would then be able to get a little bit of a mini tour in their little transit yeah. van to go around the country, which gave gave people that sort of step up. At least you're sort of not just playing in front of your friends and family and anybody else you can emotionally blackmail to go and see you. You, you know, you're playing in front of people who might have heard you hundreds of miles away and know the sort of lyrics to your song. So again, that kind of helped. And Lester must have had that, you know, that Princess Charlotte kind of centre really which Norwich had the wild club at the art centre so again it kind of helped make a band sort of believe that they could do it well yeah that's right I mean at the time as I say I was um Princess Charlotte as you quite rightly say was one of those sort of places in Leicester and I was mainly living in Cheltenham when I first saw gay bikers but we we had our own sort of particular venues small venues that you could playing like that um I think the one here was called the Axiom Centre it might have just been even called the Centre Bar at that time um but yeah they were they were crucial really I mean any small venues you, you don't seem to get as many of them now at all and, and it's so much harder to see bands and luckily we have got a decent venue still in Cheltenham but um yeah they, they certainly did it and papers like as you say uh who would you put sounds and nme and melody, melody maker, maker. in addition to sort of record mirror at the time were, were crucial i mean it, however much those papers were also sort of detrimental in the end to the to, to the bands in some respect because you know they they often built them up which is a kind of a big theme in the book how they uh, how when james brown had actually created this Gribo genre and they made it flavor of the month or, or several months for a while and then uh, inevitably it all came tumbling down and you know they were just sort of written about disparagingly and sort of cast away when they thought the next big thing was coming along that was going to make even more news. So. That, it's a cruel world I have to say it's a cruel I wish they wouldn't do that so much but anyway that's all in the past. So with 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 gay bikers what's amazing is they get a major record label don't they they get a, quite a deal and then and they also do a film as well which is kind of quite crazed. I mean when you were doing the book and researching it were you amazed because they are, they know how to sort of use recreational substances, um, and they're having an amazing time. I mean, youthful bodies or what? I mean, that's we all appreciate them as we get older, don't we? But <laughs> Christ, yeah. but you know, they they do manage to keep it together for quite a few years, which is always quite amazing when you look back at a band now, because you sort of think at the time, how did you manage to navigate? You know, both being, you know, both this unit, both you know, making music as well as you know, being given lots of money by a record company. Well, that's it. I mean, that did cross my mind as well when I was writing it at the time. Um, because that summer of 1987, I think they got signed to Virgin in June 1987. Um, they've been going probably since what, the middle of 1985, just a slow build up. The first single was released at the end of 1986. And by June 1987, they were signed to Virgin for £100,000 or something. And with some sort of clause at as long as they could make a movie as well so they were given the money i think on i'm sure one of them told me that they sort of flagged virgin by saying we could make a movie the whole movie with several songs for the same price that boy george who i think was possibly on virgin at the same time 
could make one video for one single. So they kind of went along with it and gave them that chance to do that. But as you say, that summer of 1987, after they got signed, I don't think their feet really touched the ground. They were, they were as you say, probably, um, not probably, definitely had sort of these recreational interests, which they were probably doing every day, day in, day out. They were being interviewed day in, day out. They were recording, having to start recording. They were gigging constantly. And then they had to start filming. Um, as you say, it, it's youthfulness. It obviously just keeps you going. But I do think they said at the time it was... Um, the fact that they were carried away in such a whirlwind, it took that they took their eye off the ball on the recording of the album because the album didn't turn out the way they particularly wanted it. So, but yeah, it, you know, it must have been a hard time, and I think it did eventually take its toll, especially after a few years. Yes, I think it is. And with Crazy Head, this they're sort of happening in parallel. So, with the two bands, is there much cross fertilization between them? They both. I mean, they were, they both went to school, various members went to school together at the same schools. And so they were friends from, and they lived in the same town, which was literally a few miles next town from where I lived or villages they were really um, in Leicestershire. And um, yeah, so they kind of, they all grew up together and then they started going to clubs together. They actually even started doing club nights together and DJ nights together. So Mary Biker at the Gay Bikers, initially started doing something called the Great Red Shark, which was a club night in various sort of the, the hip sort of uh, bars and clubs in, in Leicester at the time. So they were playing their favourite songs like the Stooges, Cramps and various 50s and 60s songs as well. So again, that, the old influences coming back in with various new funk stuff. Um, and then the bikers formed and and I think they were becoming road. I think Mary Biker was the bikers had various roadying for each other and then they just split off and, and formed their own separate bands. I mean, they're, they're kind of diff, very different in some respects. I think Crazy Head were more of your sort of typical garage sort of punk band, 60s sort of influenced punk band. And the bikers were certainly more psychedelic -y and with that, the Tony Bikers guitar with the, the extreme wah-wah guitar. There was a bit more experimentation and just a bit more off the wall than the bikers. So even though there was, they were all good friends, there was um, a lot of difference between the two bands. Yes, and it's interesting because because the gay the bikers get on Virgin and um, with Crazy Heads on Food Records, which is signed, you know, like you mentioned in the book, Andy Ross, who at the time I can't remember who. Oh yes, he was in. Um, Disco Zombies, wasn't he? Yeah. And, and he? And he was with David Baff, who had sort of been in various Julian Cope or Liverpool bands and then went on to sort of hit the, hit the sort of the big time with um, Blur, obviously. So again, it, yeah. both, both bands did really well to get, you know, signed in, into sort of, well, I suppose food records weren't huge at that point, but obviously they went on to be. But again, you know, they got onto a label, which does help any band who can sort of have that structure of, and a timetable of being able to, you know, put an album together and at least have some idea of longevity, even if in reality it doesn't last for that much longer. Because by the by the because the the lifestyle uh, lifespan of both bands is relatively small, isn't it? In, in yeah, you know, it does. In it their does, initial, I think in their original um, incarnations, anyway. I mean, they both sort of formed roughly about the same time. Maybe Crazy had formed a little bit later. And the bikers split initially in 1990, and then the original Crazy Head lineup also originally ruptured in the same month, December 1990, when Port Beast left. Although Crazy Head did carry on in a less um, successful format for another 10 years or so, uh, but yeah, it, it, it's it's. Um, I can't remember what we were saying now. What were you saying about the, the longevity of the Yes, bands? the longevity. I mean, it is, you know, there is that kind of almost to the day, you know, like five years, if you're lucky that you can just about survive that kind of, and that's if the rocket takes off. You know, most bands just go uh, flop. And I, I think, yeah, but also I think getting back to that, you were saying about that they were lucky to be signed to the majors. Um, obviously, bikers went on to Virgin after they were on intake and then... Um, Crazy Head, even though it was on food, food after they signed subsequently made a deal with Parlophone. So they were essentially on another huge record label. And I think, as you say, again, the fact that they were on the big labels 
and they probably weren't living up to those major labels expectations probably also had some impact on how that, that five-year lifespan or any lifespan you were saying it was sort of impacted on the how when they sort of they ended basically because the record labels had basically dropped them i think crazy head had already moved had already been dropped by parlophone or left parlophone and food by that point and we're on black records um which was at silvertone who the stone roses had already been signed to at one point and had the famous paint throwing incident yes. with they went so out, yeah i mean that obviously that all didn't help in the end when the may if you don't live up to the majors expectations they're not going to throw more money after you if they don't think they're going to get it back i suppose so. no and there was I, I guess actually i don't think it probably affected them but at that point in the late 80s that was when rough trade had gone bust and then all those other record labels and bands who had stock kind of held in that kind of warehouse or various places just went and lost everything so it kind of shook a lot you know, shook the independent scene up badly when is it the cartel which um, sort of fell down as well. So um, it's a murky world. It's murky. But the, th the amazing thing with Crazy Head, though, is that at that point they get two massive gigs, don't they? They go to Moscow for one gig and then they also go to Nambia as well, which is yeah. quite surreal. And, um, yeah. and, and how, did, how does that sort of come about? They, they're... Um... Their, rec their, their agency, I thought it was it Station, it was called Station or something. One of the um, people who worked at their, at their agents, uh, she, she um, worked for the British Council as well. So, and they were looking for bands to sort of kind of do, you know, build bridges with these various countries uh, uh, overseas. Like obviously there was, there was something in the air in the um, Eastern Europe in, Russia with Glasnost and Perestroika and things like that. And I suppose the British Council were looking to sort of kind of build bridges and some sort of cultural sort of bridges and things. And then Namibia, had, I think, was gained its independence in 1989 or 1990 as well. No, 1989. And then also there was the Romania trip that came up soon after as well, which was after the collapse of the Berlin Wall and, and basically the whole of the yes. uh, Eastern Bloc. So, and but Anderson sort of kind of amusingly related he's the lead singer of Crazy Head um, related to me that he thought that uh, they were actually really looking for someone like Tanita Tikaram some more sort to, to go over and sort of be the representative but they couldn't get hold of anyone more famous at the time so uh, Faisal Sagar I think the lady was who was who worked at the uh, agency so she she liked Crazy Head anyway because they worked for the agency and, and she kept putting them forward to the British Council and they got they got the gig literally and I think there was with the Romania trip there was Jesus Jones and Skin Games as well. Fantastic god that's um, that's just great isn't it yeah I mean just before we get go back to the book I mean what's kind of interesting because at that point there was the sort of north London sort of squat scene and so we had you know My Bloody Valentine, The Faith, Healers, um, Silverfish, all those bands and and then a few years later we probably had um, Senseless didn't we which came you know which merged a certain sort of groove rock. Senseless things? The sen no not the senseless. Um, senseless things? There was the senseless things, but there was another band who did uh, a band, a sort of song called Switch, which now I can't quite remember. But they were, it was a, but they were one of those kind of festy bands because there was like bands like the Wonder Stuff. Oh, Sensor. Sensor, that's Sensor, it. Sensor, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, not senseless. Sensor. So there was kind of, there was almost like the gay, the gay, the, the bikers and Crazy Head, if they had kept it together, I could imagine they could have easily merged into that kind of, party festy scene that really blossomed in the 90s and into kind of almost brit pop for a few years i mean it was all kind of there for them really it's interesting you should, yeah I, I think definitely crazy uh, not crazy Ed, sorry gay bikers would have probably or could have probably gone more into that kind of squat scene i think they had already been veterans of the squat scene anyway in london and various places and the music was probably more suited to it and they were already heading into that uh dance rock crossover you know the dance scene was happening the acid house scene and which was also kind of emerging festivals and raves were sort of kind of emerging at that time and they were already hanging out with people like the mutant 
um, new waste, toys. Yes. You know, yeah, new toys, mutant waste co. Anyway, I think Crazy Head were always more of that straightforward sort of garage rock rock band, and I, I think their last album. I don't know. They probably won't thank me for saying it, but I thought was kind of Brit poppy in in places. Sounded a lot Brit, a lot like Brit pop. A couple of years, several years before Brit pop happened. So they might have actually gone that way. I don't know. I mean, I don't, it's it's hard to sort of speculate, but I, I do certainly agree that the uh, bikers could have probably gone down that kind of sort of festy sort of scene. That, that yeah, way. because because in the book you mentioned the '87 Glastonbury where they bo- they both gone and played, hadn't they? Which is bizarrely my first ever Glastonbury, but I didn't see them there. Um, but then by '92, I think it's '92. You know, we had bands like the orb headline in the pyramid yeah. stage and yeah. you know, carter the unstoppable sex machine was also kind of headline in one year and and you know and everyone was off their face weren't they ecstasy was just yeah. everywhere yeah. i mean you know and so the bikers if you know could have easily adapted that sound to have been a major player in that in that festi you know because everyone was walking around with the do and everyone wanted to be like the levelers and they had the hair and the and the dreadlocks and, and the, the yeah. t-shirt off the yeah. shoulder t-shirt they they've all been so individual in their look <laughs> yeah and I, and I think really the the last gay bikers album which is often i mean a lot of people probably often overlook all of them but i mean out of all the bikers albums um pernicious nonsense which came out under the sort of pfx which was um a kind of kind of corporate name they used which they'd already sort of decided they were going to use even before they were signed to virgin um the purple fluid exchange they, they released that album and that is really heading down this dance rock crossover and there's a kind of festival vibe with also that rave vibe which is happening at the time so you can really see at the point when that came out in December 1990, which was the last time they actually played together as well, live in December 1990. I think they would have headed that way. Um, as it happened, Robert Biker, out the gay bikers, had his bass guitar nicked at a gig at um, was it King's Cross, uh, the venue at is that King's Cross or New New Cross? Right. So, yeah, so that gig at the beginning of December 1990 it was the final straw for him. And he said, I've had enough now. If someone could come backstage, a fan of ours, and steal his bass guitar, then that's it. And I think he'd been suffering from tour fatigue. But once he'd sort of kind of had a break and got over that, he just eventually got back into that rave scene, scene and carried on in the squatting scene in London and became part of various rave collectives. And there was a guy called Rocket Ron, who they recruited in early 1990, I think, before they did the, or it might have been actually 1989 or early 90. He, he was sort of like the DJ that they took on tour with them. And I think he recorded with them on the last album. And Mary said he was their conduit into the rave scene. He'd already been, he, he was kind of like an old hippie. He was a bit older than them. He'd been around the, the Stonehenge years. Um, and he also carried on into that sort of rave festival scene that was happening before Castle Morton. And then I think that's when that all got clamped down, didn't it, by the uh, the criminal justice bill after yes. Castle Morton, basically. So, yeah, they would have gone that way, definitely. Yes. So then, look, coming back to this book, which I still think it's one of the, the great books of our time. Um, <laughs> I love books like this. So when did you decide, you know, because mostly we have those kind of ideas late at night. We think, God, this is a really good idea. And then you wake up in the morning and think, oh, my God, I hope no one can remember that. But obviously you ran with this idea, didn't you? So when when did your kind of idea come up to to put a book together about the two bands and the scene? Well, I'd already written, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, a book I'd written about the Deviants and the Pink Fairies, who were sort of precursors. Well, they were sort of the hippie bands at the time because it was a hippie scene, but they were precursors of the um, the seventies punk scene. And um, yeah. I'd finished writing that, and um, I'd started listening, got back into the bikers again a bit, and uh, I thought to myself, that would be, you know, if I've, I've, been, I've written this book. If I, I'm going to write another book, then maybe. I'll do something about those, but I, I you know, I, it was way, way off in my mind. But then I'd also been writing for Vive La Rock uh, for a little while at that time. And I think Eugene, the editor of Vive La Rock, um, gave me the opportunity to do just a, a feature about Grebo. So I just did a sort of a sort of four page feature on 
1987, uh, Grebo, 1987, the year Grebo broke. So it was just a bit of an overview, which included bands like Pop Elite itself, who are obviously a major part of the Grebo scene as well. Yes. Um, you know, kind of things like Zodiac, Mind Walk, we're all, um, all these bands who were lumped under it, even though they're sort of essentially quite different in, in many respects, but they all just look very similar. And, and as the music press wanted it to be, they could write about something conveniently and get a bit of press out of. So uh, when I'd written the article, um, I thought, yeah, I, I'll, I'll carry on. I will carry on and do a book. So, I mean, I started writing it. Um, I did have a deadline of a couple of years and it, it didn't get done then. A lot of personal issues got in the way. I carried on with it as best I could. And then in the last sort of few years, couple of, well, pre-COVID, the last few years before that, I got back into it properly and finally managed to finish it. So it, it did take about eight years, I think. So. God. It is. Well, what's also fantastic, because like I said, I really enjoyed those little early bits, you know, like that kind of cultural context of what was going on, because it was quite grim during, I don't know, every decade is quite grim. I can't remember who I was speaking to yesterday, they talking about the 70s being incredibly grim. Yes, yeah, so anyway, and the 80s, I do remember that. And you kind of capture that so well in this in this kind of book with you know, like talking about the kind of the festival scene and the bat battle of the bean field. And then, mm. you know, wild parties of people taking far too many trips and then sort of, you know, doing things on people's beds and disgusting. <laughs> it really. but it's, it's great. It's great to kind of go, oh, God, yeah, I remember that. Um, ish. And um, yeah, so it, it's good. And what the other great thing is that you managed to locate so many brilliant pictures and posters as well so that that's an incredible labor of love so were you did you manage to get all the the various members of ba the bands kind of on board so to speak to to give you their story as well as bits of their archive I, yeah um I, th I think virtually everyone was uh cooperative and helped um there was one of crazy head i did manage to contact initially he it was hard and I eventually heard heard back from him and he gave me a little bit of information about his early years because I, I tried writing it from a chronological perspective from when they were growing up. I took it right back to childhood and because this was all when they were in Leicester. They were, and I didn't really hear anything more back from him in the end. I tried and, and I think he sort of kind of lost contact with the other band members. They tried getting him back in for a potential reunion before a crazy head reunion did actually happen and it didn't happen. So... I didn't get much input from him, but he did He did initially sort of, um, well, at one point, um, contact me and get in touch. But the rest of them were pretty much cooperative, really. And, um, and I'm really grateful for it because, as I said, it took a long time to write. And I think they must have just been getting exasperated when I'd started writing it. And they're spending all this time either emailing me or were interviewing me. I was interviewing them. And then it seemed to be like, I'm getting nowhere because this book just wasn't happening you know I had too many things to deal with and they could have easily just thought yeah yeah it's not going to happen but you know, they all helped and I mean Facebook was good in the respect that there were a lot of photos on there and there were a lot of photo photos on their respective Facebook pages or social media pages and they were happy to let me use them and the various band members who had stuff that wasn't on Facebook uh let me use them like Anderson the lead singer of Crazy Head would send me photos that he hadn't posted and I'd sort of scan them and send them back to him so there was a lot of co cooperation and I mean I just hope I've done them proud in that respect I mean they've said I've had but you know apparently some things they all remember things differently but they're again, you know they're going to yeah, my God. I mean, I mean, to be honest, I, and and you probably realise, and you know, my other thing, because I've been doing the, you know this show for quite a while, and um, I realise actually, I think a passing of time is quite important for people for various reasons. One is that sometimes after the event, everyone's a little bit emotionally, you know, there's there's a few issues, let's put it that way, and need to let that kind of drift a bit and get on with the rest of their life to then think, yeah, yeah. I mean, some people have lost, often said. If you asked me five years ago, I'd have not wanted to do the interview, but now I'm not that bothered. I can, I mean, I can mm. look at it a bit better now and and not feel so feel so annoyed after 25 years. But 30 years is fine. So often there is a passing of time, which which kind of 
I think helps that, that. And also, yeah, talking about that narrative and, and there's been like, as you probably realize the eighties, so suddenly there was nothing about the eighties apart from, you know, Dylan Jones going on about Spandau Ballet and the Blitz kids. But then there was, well, there's been films on, you know, George Best by, you know, the album by, you know, the wedding present and the Dolly mixtures and the Triffids and the chills. And there's suddenly like people making the most obscure films that you think, well, God, there can't be that much of an audience. And then, you know, there was Stuart Lee did that film about Robert Lloyd from the Nightingales and his life. And, and when they were talking about it, it was like creating these kind of false narratives going, well, we're not quite sure what happened, but let's just kind of go with that story. And, and as long as it's not libelous or not slanderous, you know, it's going to have to get do, isn't it? So you must, when you have various members of a band, it must feel like, I think we've just about got the truth. There's nothing too bad about this. Yeah, exactly. Well, whether they agree with it, some of the various comments or not is another matter. It's there, and it, it, everyone's going to have different opinions, maybe at times. And so, yeah, I, I think, in essence, I've got what I could really. I mean, I, as far as the music press goes, as you say, there, as we were discussing earlier, I think um, before the interview, maybe there is sometimes a bit too much detail. I just sort of kind of totally went overboard with the. Um, music press cuttings and various reviews but as i said once i'd started getting into that going into the british library and just finding all these old nmes and uh sounds magazines and melody makers you, ju you just spend the whole day in there and get lost and it, i know it's amazing and it, it all makes up part of the story even though a lot of the music press stuff is probably fabricated well not a lot some of it is all kind of tongue-in-cheek but it all adds to the story and it happened you know that's how it was reported so Yes, and it was amazing. They were getting front page, you know, covers yeah. on, on publications that had, you know, a circulation of, I can't remember, was it 100,000 on some of the NME and Melody Maker? I think so. I mean, NME and Sounds, um, well, I'm Melody Maker, I should imagine, particularly um, Record I mean, Record Mirror was very useful as well. It still had quite a few things about the bikers in when I was researching, but they did have large sort of circulations. And it, it was kind of at the time when magazines like, Q had just started, hadn't it, I think, in the late 80s, and then Select in the, perhaps 89, 90. But yes. as you say, it was those weekly ones that were really the, um, the, you say, the gatekeepers for sort of the scenes like, you know, the indie scene and bands like Gay Bikers and, well, Sounds particularly. But Yeah. I mean, when you were doing the book, what was it tricky to sort of really get to a bit where you thought, right, this is going to be the end now. I'm not going to write another chapter. I'm not going to add another bit. I've got to, I've got to keep it kind of, I've got to get to that full stop and say, that's it. Because it, with bands, you know, obviously they reform, they kind of do other things. They do side projects. There's always another little bit of a story. Was that difficult at times knowing when to say, right, that is going to have to be it now, guys. I can't, I can't add another chapter anymore. I can't rewrite another bit. Absolutely. Uh, initially, when I started writing it, all those many years ago, which it was, I said at the time, because, as, as you've also quite rightly pointed out, their sort of main, both bands' main years were those few years between probably 86 or 87 to 1990. I was going to make the cut-off point 1990, just simply because they were probably the band's main glory years. Uh, bikers split up then. Crazy had initially had their first main band rupture then the basis left but they did carry on for years but the more I did it and the more I carried on and um, I thought no I've got to I, I had to carry on and I, I can't remember the point when I thought I had to go beyond 1990 but I suppose I could have just cut it off at 1990 but it wouldn't have been half the story it is now I don't think because it it has subsequently told a further 10 years of crazy head and the various sort of lineups um it's kind of told solo it's vaguely touched upon mary Biko's solo career who, who's had a very illustrious solo career i hasten to add as well with bands like pig face hyperhead uh, apollo 440 i mean who obviously became quite a big chart act in the late 1990s yes um so yeah i carried on and then the other thing so i'd also then at this point decided <laughs> decided to stop doing it i don't know maybe three or four years ago and then or five years ago then the gay bikers decided to reform again and i hadn't finished it by then so obviously i couldn't finish it without then covering the gay bikers 
reunion tour in 19, uh, in 2016. Yes, indeed. So then I had to kind of, so again, it was another extension of the book. And then the year after, Crazy had reformed. So then there was another year of reunion gigs. And then the pandemic happened and they were meant to be touring again. And Gay Bikers released the first new recordings. Uh, so, yeah. so I kind of really updated it basically till about September 19, uh, September 2020, I think. Yes, so it, it was. It, it kept getting added to. I couldn't stop without. I mean, it was maybe my fault for not getting things written up quickly, then stopping. But then something else would happen that I had to write about. This time, I, I, I can't. It's done now. The, the, the gay bikers' final. This recent reunion's done, so I can't write about that. Yes, I mean, and and you with the reflection of you know studying it and and sort of almost living it. I mean, if you <clears throat> if you had been a manager for one of these bands. I mean, how would you have tried to have navigated, you know, the, the kind of life of the band? How, you know, were there things that you, by, by doing this book, did you think, God, oh, that was a terrible mistake? They, they or not, I mean, you shouldn't focus on the negative, should, one should. But, you know, there were, were there things you'd have, if you had been a manager, you just thought <laughs> to yourself, if I'd been a manager, I would have just at that point have done something else or have persuaded them to do something else. Is there, from, from sort of analysing it like you have or lived it like you have, I just wondered if there was such a, some thoughts, bullet points you had. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm probably the, the last person to ask about managing things to be honest but uh yeah I don't know I mean I, I was I'm at the same age as them and I was probably kind of doing I mean, obviously apart from being in a famous band or you know or a, a band that's doing what they were doing but I was probably doing doing some the, the similar other sort of recreational activities that they were anyway so I probably wouldn't have been in a position to sort of but I know what you mean I, I say if you were managing if I'm talking from a perspective of what the band members have told me or various band members have told me, they seem to think that had they had um, good, strong management, they would have probably been advised better to be good boys, buy houses, put money by, but, you know, they didn't. And um, I don't know. I, I, I know. Yeah. Don't ask me about managing people. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those interesting ones, because I must admit, I have got a great respect for bands who manage to keep it going. You know, even if I'm not that keen on that band, I just think, A, the dynamics between them. Also, they've had to have some of those probably quite important and grown up conversations, as well as looking at the big picture. And you're thinking probably by and still being quite young and, and thinking, look, guys, let's or, you know, whatever gender, let's let's see if we can keep this going, because frankly, I don't want to get a proper job you know I don't want it to be you know all over quite yet and I suppose that you know I do have great respect because having done all these interviews with sort of indie bands especially you know it, it isn't made to last for more than five years is it because often the band hate themselves and they've made no money <laughs> and it's like we've just had enough we just we're gonna we're not even gonna have to look around and think will I regret this no I just had enough you know um, you know, so it's in, it's it's a weird world, isn't it? Because as a fan, it it's just brilliant. You just appreciate people are going to do that for us. But you you know, I used to envy bands, and now I just think, God, I don't know how you did it, really. No, well, that's, getting back to what you were saying about how they would have managed things, and you, you also mentioned about the collapse of the um, rough trade and the cartel, the indie sort of distribution network, and everything like that. I mean, gay bikers at that point had. I mean, they were, as you say, they're young young men. They'd lost their major record deal, and they decided to set up their own record label. And they were sort of kind of managing themselves. They had the assistance of a chap called Martin Elborn, I think, who was one of the main sort of Glastonbury helped organise Glastonbury's years ago and things like that. He wasn't the manager, but he was sort of kind of this sort of um, advisor. But they they got on with things and they were doing things. So they set up their own label. And they'd started licensing stuff. So they, they'd started, uh, Butthole Surfers did a side project, Digital Dump. So they had, they were, they were trying to get into releasing other bands. They were doing these kind of things. But they were actually, you know, they were guiding themselves, even though they didn't have a manager. Um, but again, this all coincided with the time the bassist 
Rob, a bike of the bassist, got his bass guitar nicked and the rough trade collapsed. And that was a big kick in the teeth, as you say, because they had bedrooms and sort of like a warehouse full of material. They'd probably spent all the money that they ever had left from Virgin, if they had much anyway, after the fallout with one of their earlier managers. Um, and yeah, so basically that kind of put pay to things anyway. So, you know, it is hard. Yes, no, I mean, it, is, it isn't easy, is it? Because I guess no band starts thinking they're going to make it. And when they do have that moment, there is no time to waste. So you don't even have time to even properly read a contract and work out what you're signing. Well, you, just, <laughs> you just sign it and then think, oh dear, that wasn't the best move. But it's, it's, always, it's always in hindsight, isn't it? But I, I think the book is brilliant. I love the fact that you've got you know, a lot of mentions of the other band, but the Bomb Party, which was in there, yeah. as, as well as you know, good old John Langford from the Mekons. And, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it, it's, it's just a great pay, pay, you know, page turner. So thank you ever so much for spending eight years of your life, which is longer than being in the band, <laughs> of, yeah. of writing a classic, really. And yeah, I mean, the Butthole Surfers, I'd forgotten I'd seen them in about 19... 19 some London venue and thought wow that's amazing so yeah yes Sonic Youth Nirvana yeah. you know that was all it was all happening but look this is brilliant well thank you once again for um giving me the time for this interview and, and sort of such an amazing book so um and if you uh, did you record the interview by the way um I, I hope so <laughs> yeah <laughs> I guess that's it's, got... it's recording I don't know whether that's you recording it or me there yeah, well, I'm happy to give you, you know, you can you can have a copy of it and then you can use it if you want elsewhere because feel free, you know, because it's, I, it's probably, you know, it's good to get the word out there because frankly, Christmas is around the corner and people should buy this book. That's what I say. It, okay, well, thank you. I'm glad you liked it and thank you for inviting me onto the show anyway. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, and I'll send you the link as well when I do it so you can you can have that. But um, thank thanks a lot. And um I'm sure. Okay. Have you got, have you got anything else in in the sort of pipeline? Just briefly. Uh, what book wise? Or, is or it, yeah, book wise. Um, I, I may try and um, get round to updating the Deviants and Pink Fairies book. So because since uh, when that was published in 2008, there were again reformations of the Deviants and then the Pink Fairies after Mick Farron died so there is a bit to update with, with regards to that but I'm taking a bit of a break for now to be honest I've sort of kind of <laughs> had a very intense eight well eight years on and off so <laughs> yes enough but look I'll let you go but thank you again for this this has been amazing okay. take care thank you cheers, cheers. thank you bye very bye. much cheers and bye, bye. And that was me in conversation with Rich Deacon talking about his latest book, Grebo, The Loud and Lousy Sound of Gay Bikers on Acid and Crazy Head. This has come out on Head Press Publishing and um, is available from all good bookshops and also online. So do check it out. And also, yes, buy a copy because um, it's been incredibly well put together and some fantastic pictures, stories of the time. Anyway, look. Uh, this has been David Eastall, The C86 show, show. If you want to contact me, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just go to, um, yes, I don't know, yes, C86 show. Just Google that, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, keep it positive and groovy. Otherwise, don't bother. And also, all these interviews have been archived, so you can find those on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean. It's true. Anyway, look, have a great week and stay safe. <laughs>